right, guys. I love Lana Del Rey. Um, okay, guys. Um, let me uh, tell you what's going on tonight. So, um, hi, Sage and Sapphire. Hola. Hi, guys. I love you so much. Um, thank you so much. Okay, so some of you know that... Uh, I have adenomyosis and endometriosis. And so uh, basically I've had endometriosis since I was 12 years old. I've struggled with extremely bad periods my entire life, really debilitating. Uh, thanks, Viviana. Um, I would often have to leave school. I couldn't work a full-time job. I was a shoe designer and uh, the endometriosis really pulled me away from being able to um, to work. And then in 2003, um, uh, oh thanks, I, I have heard Liv Tyler. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in 2003, yes, Dr. Lipman, you have to um, you have to send me a request. Do you see? You have to request to come inside the live, and then um, I will bring you in. Let me see. Go live with. Let me see if this is working. Hi, Naz. Oh, Dr. Lippin, hi! How are you doing? <gasps> I am like 90% better. I just want to, let me just uh, first explain to everybody um, exactly what we did and what was going on, right? So I had endometriosis, or I've had endometriosis literally since I was 12 years old, and I have had insanely bad cycles. In 2003, I had a laparotomy. Um, I had a huge 13 centimeter chocolate cyst. My tubes were covered with endo. Um, and so after that, I had a lot of side effects from that laparotomy. I had a lot of scar tissue. And um, basically what happened was I ended up needing a laparoscopy because that first doctor didn't get all the endo. And then my third procedure, I had hydrosalpinx, my tubes closed. And they wanted to take my tubes out um, in 2009. And um, I, I actually didn't let them take my tubes out and I have been able to open them uh, through a few natural things that I've been doing. But so basically what happened was in 2014, I had cycles like I never had before. I mean, like on the floor, throwing up, unbearable, where nothing would take the pain away. I'd have to go to the ER just to get some relief. And so it's been like that for seven years, right? And so at first they just said it was a fibroid. It took them about nine months to discover that I had adenomyosis. Yep. And guys, adenomyosis is um, endometriosis that invades the muscle of the uterus. So since 2014, I've been looking for someone to help me to avoid a hysterectomy because most doctors told me that was my only option. The pill didn't work. The pill actually made the, the uh, pain more severe. And I was in pain 14 days a month, like this heaviness leading up to ovulation and the size of my uterus. I remember when we did the MRI, you told me my uterus was the size of a three to four month pregnancy. Right. And so I was in the last seven years, I've like, I've not been able to function. It's been so bad. So I found Dr. Lipman, um, I was actually in Paris a year ago and someone from Ireland reached out to me and told me about this procedure. It's called a, a uterine artery embolization. And I started to research and I found you because you've done more procedures than anyone in the US. 
And you actually told me that the procedure was actually discovered in France. Is that correct? Right. That's right. Kind of by accident. Kind of by accident because they were basically doing it um, before, because they have socialized medicine, they were actually doing this before a hysterectomy to shrink the fibroids. And right. because of socialized medicine, there was a time period and of three months. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, they'd be waiting, say, six or eight. Any elective surgery done in Europe, because of the socialized healthcare system there, they're, people are waiting six, seven, eight weeks or more to get their elective operation. And so they would get embolized and then go home and wait for their elective hysterectomy. And, a num and these women started calling their gynecologist after about three, four weeks saying, wait a minute, my symptoms are great. My, my symptoms are gone. Do I still need that hysterectomy? And when they looked at it, the answer was no. All you had to do was be embolized. You didn't need the second part. And so the uh, group in France, um, the gynecologist part of that, uh, called his friend who was the chief of gynecology at UCLA and said, you better get the interventional radiologist on this and see if you can reproduce this great result. And sure enough, Scott Goodwin, who was an interventional radiologist at UCLA at the time, did the first 11 cases in the United States. And I happened to be at a meeting. I, I've been embolizing other tumors for a long time. And I was presenting my data. Scott was presenting his data at this meeting. And I'm like, wow, this is fabulous. So I took that knowledge back to Atlanta and I've been doing fibroid embolizations for the past 25 years, not only for fibroids, but as you mentioned, it's good for adenomyosis too. How'd you find that out? How did you discover it was good for adenomyosis? Well, we didn't know initially, but we figured it was involving the uterus and it was hypervascular like fibroids given a shot because as you know, adenomyosis, so many things have been tried, but the only thing that has worked other than embolization has been hysterectomy and we want to try to avoid hysterectomy if we can and the vast majority of our patients are able to avoid hysterectomy with adenomyosis and sometimes they have both adenomyosis and fibroids like i had both and yeah, so success rate is a little better for fibroids um the success for fibroids is is 90 percent or so the success for adenomyosis is somewhere in that 75 to 80. Um, so it's not quite as good because it's not quite as discreet as a fibroid. It's a little more infiltrative. So it's a little harder to knock it out completely. But still, absolutely anybody should try the embolization first rather than just hysterectomy. I mean, because it's the majority of patients will get the relief they're looking for. So one, you know, I'm very fortunate because I have my company and I don't have to go to a nine to five job. If I did, I would not have been able to work the last seven years. And so I'm having this meeting with you because my heart just sympathizes with all of these women because no one understands this pain. Can, can you explain like, when you hear feedback of how bad this pain is that we have, like do you oh. hear? like absolutely yeah. it's described as you know crippling labor-like pain um doubled over in the fetal position um you know it's it's as significant a pain and it and what's what's as bad as that is that it continues to happen it's not you know it's it's over and over it's this cyclical pain that happens every month and it's not only physically, you know, disabling to patients, it's mentally taxing. I mean, it, the, the mental aspect is, is not to be ignored. It's significant. And, you know, women are in, you know, in charge of the health care of the family. And, you know, it's always like take, every, take care of everybody else first and me last. Yeah. And, you know, so it's a significant burden when mom is not feeling well, the whole family is suffering. And so... Um, we see a lot of this every day in the office. I mean, families are s significantly impacted by this. And, you know, it, it, to, ha to have the COVID stuff going on on top of it, I mean, it's just, uh, it's really uh, heart-wrenching. I was, 
if this hadn't come into my life, I don't really know what I would have done. I, I, at one point, I would have probably had the hysterectomy. And that was just something I wanted to avoid because I'm too young and I don't want to go through menopause. Right. But when um, I... Oh, and something else that I wanted to mention is um, for fibroids, for example, I know that black women are at a higher risk for them, right? Yes, absolutely so. Um, it has a couple of, a couple of reasons why. Um, unfortunately, nobody knows where fibroids come from, but once they arrive on the scene, they grow with hormones, estrogen in particular. Um, and so uh, estrogen is stored in fat. And so the more body fat you have on you, the more estrogen stimulation. And if you look racially at body fat, it parallels the looking at it by, by fibroid incidence. So the highest group is African-American women in both categories, and the lowest is Asian women. And so when patients come to me, a lot of the patients I see are um, African-American, and a number of them are overweight or obese or morbidly obese. And one of the first things we can do is to try to help them eat better, exercise, lose excess body fat. Um, and also vitamin D is another important thing. Uh, low vitamin D is very common in um, people of color. So it has to do with how we get vitamin D. We absorb it in our skin. And if you have darker pigmented skin, it's harder to get adequate vitamin D. And that's a very powerful anti-fibroid uh, vitamin, if you will. So we can make these health, healthy choices and changes, and that can really impact your health and um, your fibroid health and your overall cardiovascular health. So um, I take D3 with K2 every single day because uh, the K2 makes it absorb better. And it's something I promote um, like every single week on uh, my Instagram, just the importance of it in protecting and boosting the immune system, even protecting yeah. against getting COVID. Um, and then, of course, helping women with their thyroid as well, because if your thyroid's functioning, then the rest of your hormones are functioning. But I do want to say that I eat so healthy and so clean. My weight is about 104 pounds, and I still have the fibroids. But what I want to ask you and what an important question is, is do you think that C-section laparotomy surgeries and that doing C-section surgeries to deliver a baby is contributing to higher uh, risk of getting adenomyosis? Um, I don't think anybody knows exactly, but certainly any surgery, particularly when you cut on the uterus, um, I think that does increase your risk. Um, because what adenomyosis is, essentially, is the lining cells of the uterus are now plunging deeper into the more muscular uh, uterus, right below where the lining is. These lining cells are now kind of being found deeper into the muscle. And so if you're cutting into the uterus, it, it wouldn't, I mean, it sounds very uh, logical that you would expect these cells to be kind of transported deeper and that increases your risk to get adenomyosis. So while I don't think there's anyone has ever actually proven that, if that were the, that were the case, it would be logical. So, okay, so I wanna say a couple of things because constipation, I think, is really what is contributing to exacerbating the pain symptoms of having fibroids, adenomyosis, endometriosis, and when you're, because when you're constipated, and then you're, you have like not a lot of room in like your uterus anyway. So to have like impacted constipation and to have that pressure on top of everything else, I think is really making the pain worse. So. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, um, fibroids are hard and firm like rocks and they press on things. And we've had a number of patients with big fibroids in the back of their uterus pressing on the colon, causing difficulty moving their bowels or painful bowel movements. And it was not appreciated that it's coming from fibroids. So they get an extensive gastrointestinal workup with the GI doctors and they can't find anything. 
Um, and it's a simple mechanical thing. The fibroid is pressing on the colon from the outside. It lives, the colon lives right behind the uterus. And so it can easily cause this. Um, they can also cause um, urinary frequency and waking up at night because the bladder sits in front of the uterus. So depending on where these fibroids are, if they're located along the lining, they'll cause heavy bleeding. And in fact, it's the number one reason why women have heavy periods. But these other bulk related symptoms have to do with where the fibroids are located and what they're pressing on. Right. And so, and we don't have um, a definitive answer of what causes the fibroids, but we know that Asian women are at lowest risk for them. Right. And they have the lowest body fat. And again, it, it, it boils down to estrogen. And so um, we take a very anti-estrogenic approach. You can't avoid hormones, but um, we try to tell patients, you know, first of all, avoid the hormone-rich foods if you can, or, or eliminate them if you even better, but try to limit them. And those are red meat, non-organic chicken, dairy, um, and you can substitute. You can do kind of nut milk for dairy. You can do organic chicken for non-organic. Meat, meat is a little harder, but um, so we try to avoid those things and then increase anti-estrogenic foods like colored fruits and vegetables, which have flavonoids in them that block estrogen production. We mentioned vitamin D. Uh, exercise. Dim. dim is a great supplement because it's the cruciferous vegetables and the cruciferous vegetables really help the body to get the, the estrogen out as well. But, you know, I two or three years ago, my estradiol level was a 925. That's enough for an entire block of women. It was absolutely insane. And I started to work with uh, a natural doctor, Will Cole. And what he told me, and this was the first time somebody had told me this, he said, cut out the phytoestrogens as well, like the tempeh, because your body cannot distinguish between good and bad estrogen because you're filled with it. So right. I, I actually started to cut out um, some of the phytoestrogen. But what's so interesting is that Asian women drink soy milk. And yeah. soy milk uh, is... Yeah, soy is kind of a mixed bag. I mean, as you mentioned, some of the soys have phytoestrogens in them. And, and it has some good qualities. In fact, uh, because they're plant-based estrogens, some of them will compete for the estrogen receptor and, and block them. And so it's like pulling into a parking space that estrogen normally parks in a certain receptor, but if the phytoestrogen is already there, estrogen gets blocked. And so some of the phytoestrogens are, are good. It's kind of a mixed bag. Some are good and some are not, and it, it gets kind of complicated, but um, some of the soys are good. Do you think that then sugar converts to estrogen as well? Yeah, I mean, you want to try to limit sugars. I mean, particularly those, you know, the processed foods, process, you know, the sugar intake. I mean, anything that's going to lead to excess fat um, should try to be, you should try to limit that and try to be as close. We tell patients, you don't have to be skinny. Just try to be as close to your ideal body weight as you can through eating, eating well, healthier choices and exercise. Lose that excess body fat. That will help, not, again, not only your fibroid health, but your overall cardiovascular health. So why don't you um, explain exactly what the procedure is? So guys, it's a minimal procedure. Um, yep. It's not a surgery where you're cut oh, open. Oh, totally but, um, surgical. Um, I'm I feel gonna like go going into, the... into an eclipse here. I'm, I'm going to try to improve the lighting here just for one yeah. second. <laughs> we got to see you. We got to get some light on. Um, so guys, really quick, um, basically, I had talked to a few women who had told me that this procedure, that um, there's not, uh, it's not a long procedure, but I had heard from other people that afterwards that the recovery is torture. That's what I heard. So that's why it took me a year to come and see you because I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I can go through any more physical pain. Like I literally can't take any more pain. So I called Dr. Livin and I said, just be honest with me. Like how much pain am I going to be in after? And I was so 
happy because when I got to his office, it was a, an outpatient procedure. Um, when I got to his office, your nurse had told me that you had come up with something afterwards to eliminate the pain. So why don't you go in and talk about what the procedure is and what right. you do exactly? What we do is we, um, the approach is at the top of the right leg where you feel your pulse, like in the groin area. That's just our entry point into the body. That's an artery. I, that's that's one yeah, of the the, arteries. It's the right common femoral artery. And we locally put some numbing medicine in the skin as well as IV medicine. The patients sleep through the procedure. It takes me about 30 to 40 minutes uh, maximum. Um, and so the patients sleep through the whole thing. But we enter the artery and I can pass this little tiny catheter. It's the size of a piece of spaghetti into each of the two uterine arteries one at a time. Each of the arteries branch like a tree, getting smaller and smaller branches to get out to the leaves. The fibroids are the leaves of the tree, and I know what size those tiny peripheral branches are, and I can flow direct these particles to plug up the blood supply to all the fibroids. So it doesn't matter if you have one fibroid or a hundred, all of them should get knocked out. Without a blood supply, those fibroids will start to die. And as they die, they soften and shrink. And a woman's symptoms start to go away. So this 30-minute procedure, um, she recovers at our center for about four hours. And then she goes home. She's discharged with just a Band-Aid at the top of her right leg where we entered. That's it, a Band-Aid. So yeah, there, it's a bandaid, and then there's uh, like it's like a, a stick, a sticky substance that basically falls off after like two and a half, three weeks. And the incision is literally like a quarter of an inch. It's a small incision, or maybe like a half of an inch. Um, but what I want to know is when you're going into the artery, you're basically putting like a sand-like substance that's cutting off the supply, is that correct? That's correct, it's called polyvinyl alcohol. It's the material contact lenses are made out of. So there's a long track record of safety. Um, it's completely inert, it doesn't react in any way. Um, it's why it was originally chosen many, many years ago. So I've embolized people for the past 25 years with PVA and even longer with other tumors. So. I'm not aware of anyone having any issue, not only in my extensive experience of over 9,000 fibroid embolizations, but anybody else's. It's, it's a very safe, tiny, microscopic medical implant. So, guys, um, I've had five, this, is now, this was now my fifth procedure, right? So I had had multiple endometriosis-related laparoscopy, laparotomy surgeries. And um, what happens when you're put under, um, you put, you use local, right? It's local, local anesthesia. Local and, and intravenous sedation, both. So, and then you're given some pain medicine that can constipate you. So I knew from the past that what I needed to make sure I was doing was not getting constipated because that is what will cause the most pain after. So what I did was, um, I, I know you gave me like a list of things to get from the store. So I took the Colace. Okay. But the, starting the night before I basically like, no, I don't, I think I started that night actually. I doubled the amount of magnesium I would normally take. Maybe I started the night before I took like six magnesium citrate and I also got um, like a magnesium powder. And I basically just took a lot of that to not get constipated. I was in pain for an hour and a half that first night. I didn't take any hardcore pain medicine. The only thing I was taking was 800 milligrams of Motrin. I was a little uncomfortable. I had like cramps. It was 90% easier than my period. And you said to me, you're like, listen, you can handle it. You have this every single month, so you can handle it. So I went into it. I always go into everything, like hoping for the best, expecting the worst. So I had really geared myself up for a year. I had talked to my girlfriend the day before. She had had the procedure in Texas. And she told me that she was in so much pain for like 
two weeks and I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, okay, I, I got to go through it. But I had literally under two hours of pain and I was fine. Like by, well, I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I think that experience matters. And that's why we see patients from all over, not only all over the United States, but even other countries. Um, we do a number of things that um, mitigate a lot of the pain that other places experience. Um, so yes, we do see some patients that have a, a significant amount of pain afterwards, but fortunately that's really rare because we do a number of things on the front end. It's always harder to chase pain once it's present, but we do a lot of things on the front end to try to mitigate that so the patient doesn't experience that. And um, one of the things that we do is we use intraarterial lidocaine, um, which is really helpful. Um, we we what give. What is that exactly? It's it lidocaine is an anesthetic, but we can give it in the in the arteries that supply the uterus, and so you get kind of an anesthetic effect on, you know, the, the uterine pain afterwards is because the fibroids are angry that I've suffocated them. So like in a heart. I can give an example like a heart attack. If somebody, if somebody has a blockage in one of their coronary arteries, um, to the, and now the heart muscle is not getting the same amount of blood flow, so it, it, you start feeling chest pain. And that's you know, something that alerts you that you're having pain in your chest. You want to make sure that you, you fix that because you don't want your heart muscle to die. Well, with fibroids, we want them to die, but the pain is because the fibroid is not getting the amount of blood flow purposely that it's used to. So it's, the pain is a response to that. And so we can put in lidocaine into the branches of the uterine artery and it kind of anesthetize the, the normal pain response from the uterus and it helps a lot. Yeah, so I had the procedure on Wednesday and um, by Saturday, like I was, out all day, I was like walking around. That night we drove to Savannah. Sunday I was great. Um, I had some bleeding for about three weeks up until my next um, cycle. So it was like three, three weeks of light bleeding. Then I had my cycle and my cycle was like 60, 70% easier. Good. And which was amazing. So, um, so tell me, because the reason I'm really having you on is I want women to know that there is an alternative that they do not have to get a hysterectomy if they have adenomyosis or fibroids. And I want them to know that um, they can save their uterus. Absolutely. And, and, and can you get pregnant after you have the procedure? Yes, you can. We've had numerous children born after UFE. I've had multiple sets of twins born. Um, there's a lot of disinformation out there, and um, they've got to get a second opinion from an interventional radiologist like myself that has a lot of experience in this because, frankly, I mean, I, I've been doing this procedure for the past 25 years, yet most women have never heard about it, and it's really a shame. Um, they'll hear all sorts of things. Well, you know, the, first of all, the gynecologists often don't mention it as an option, and they should. But then when it comes up, if it, if it does come up, they'll say, oh, you have too many fibroids, or your fibroids are too big, or if you're interested in children, you can't have it. All of those things are false. Um, and so you've really got to do your own homework. Get that second opinion, uh, because, yes, there's a lot of patients we've done over the years that have had children. I've had multiple sets of twins. So absolutely, you can have children afterwards, but um, we've got to stop doing all these unnecessary hysterectomies. If you have uterine cancer, hysterectomy is appropriate, but the number one reason in this country, and we lead the world in hysterectomies, is for benign fibroids. Why in the world are we amputating women for benign disease? It makes no sense. We've been doing it for years. We've got to stop doing this. Yeah, it's, it's so insane to me because one, 
Um, they're doing it for women who have endometriosis and most women's symptoms are not going away after they're still in pain. And two, they're gaining a lot of weight and then they're going through menopause when they're young. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, the average age of hysterectomy in this country is 39 and I have wet, I have met way too many women under the age of 30 that have already had hysterectomy for fibroids. None of them wanted it, but they were suffering so badly. And their gynecologist said that that was the only option. And, and it's tragic. I mean, I, it's just so awful. Um, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking and it's very upsetting. And uh, I'm going to put this uh, live on my website. I'm going to send it out on my mailer and I'm gonna get the word out about you because you're really saving lives and you're saving women from an awful surgery that they don't need. And you really, I mean, you've come into my life. I think you've like, you've been an angel and you've saved me from years and years of pain. And I'm so grateful to you. And I just wanna say thank you so much for that. I, I, I appreciate the kind words. I mean, um, it's you, uterine fibroid embolization is one of the biggest medical breakthroughs for women, yet most women are unaware of it. I mean, there are over a million women in the United States right now suffering with fibroids. They don't want hysterectomy, and I don't blame them, so they just suffer with it. In fact, I just wrote a recent article for Rolling Out magazine here in Atlanta called Keeping It Moving. A lot of my patients, they're women, and particularly they're women of color, and they just keep it moving. They don't want surgery, they don't want hysterectomy. They're miserable, but they have no choice. Either they can't miss two months of work from a hysterectomy, and so they just suffer. They pad themselves up as much as possible, and they drag themselves to work because they, they can't take the time off, or they're in a male-dominated workplace that doesn't understand about these women problems. Um, and, you know, when they're away from work or they can't work two or three days a month or they they keep getting up out of their chair to go to the bathroom or whatever it is it's not understood because you know men don't understand about women's periods um also they may be the only woman of color in their workplace and so not only is the mental anguish of what they're going through they feel a responsibility for who might come after me um it's it's incredible i mean it, it's it's such a physical and mental anguish that we could eliminate so easily if they knew about UFE. Yeah, because it, it uh, causes depression. You know, when you're in that much physical pain every single month, it takes a toll on you. It literally causes depression. It interferes with your work. It interferes with your friends, your children. And you know what? is really upset about it is that most of the time other people do not understand it. No. And they don't. And it gets in the men. way of relationships. Right. You know? We talk to men all the time about this because um, I, I, I can talk about this because she came forward with her story, but Cynthia Bailey from the Real Housewives of Atlanta was a patient and she almost got a divorce over her periods because her, her husband at the time didn't understand what she was going through. All he could understand was from his perspective, he wasn't getting his, they weren't having relations, not because she didn't love him. They weren't having relations because she was literally gushing blood. I mean, it was pouring out. She didn't, you know, I mean, you can't have relations when that's going on. And not only that, she was anemic from all the blood she was losing. So she was tired and fatigued and, you know, let's face it, sex is exercise. And when you're anemic and, and tired and weak, exercise goes out the window. Yeah. And then you're, then you're wearing all this, you know, gear, multiple pads, sometimes adult diapers. Obviously, you don't feel very sexual. And so he was interpreting all of this. He didn't understand what was going on. All he could understand was, we're not having relations. She must not love me. And so... They've got they, once they had a you know communication. That's what's really key is communication and understanding what she was going through, and then she had the UFE procedure, 
as she said, I gave her her sexy back, um, and it saved their marriage. <laughs> um, yeah, it's then the brain fog happens, and then you're so tired. Like I would only be able to work out like two weeks a month. I'd only be able to like fully a hundred percent work two weeks a month. So everything was my entire life was crammed into two weeks, and then the other two weeks. Everybody knew I couldn't make plans. I couldn't do anything. Like I would cancel all of the time. Like they knew I was basically in my bed and bedridden two weeks a month. Yeah. Literally since 2014. Everything revolves around their menstrual. It's it's it whether they can work or not, whether they can have relations or not, whether they can go to the pool, whether they can do anything. Everything revolves around that horrible miserable period and it happens month after month after month and it doesn't have to be that's the key is that if you're suffering with fibroids or adenomyosis uterine artery embolization uae or ufe uterine fibroid embolization it's the same procedure they're interchangeable um ufe uae can give you your life back it's it's transformative people's lives have been literally transformed and they're free. They're free from all the, the having to know what every, where every bathroom is. Where having you know some women come to my office with a bag of extra clothing. I mean, everything revolves around that nasty period. Or like putting literal like towels down on the bed before you right. sleep. Right. Yes. I mean, you know, because they're so afraid of accidents, and um, you just don't know when that's going to happen. Um, it just doesn't yeah. have to be. Um, you know, we've got to stop doing all this unnecessary surgery because fibroids yeah. are the number one reason why women have heavy periods. It's also the number one reason why women get hysterectomies, and we've got to start substituting U UFE for hysterectomy. Did you say that over one million women a year have are suffering from fibroids? Over 1 million women right now in the United States are suffering with fibroids on the sidelines. Uh, you know, a number of them eventually give up and, you know, get a hysterectomy, but... Um, How many women are getting hysterectomies a year for fibroids? Somewhere in the range of 600 to 700,000 a year. Oh, my gosh. So and how, how many women have adenomyosis, do you think? I don't know the numbers on how many have adenomyosis. It's not quite as common as fibroids, but a lot of our patients have both. Um, and, it, and it goes undetected because adenomyosis is really, is you can t detect Only it. an MRI, right? Right, you need the MRI. So gynecologists will use ultrasound and commonly will, will miss adenomyosis. I see women all the time that have been, quote, diagnosed with fibroids based on an ultrasound, and they have no fibroids at all. They have adenomyosis because adenomyosis will make your uterus big. And so when they see a big uterus, particularly if it's an African-American woman with the symptoms of fibroids, because they're the same as adenomyosis, um, they will give them that diagnosis. Um, and when we get the MRI, I have to explain to them, no, you don't have fibroids in this case. Um, you have adenomyosis, and I have to explain what that is. Um, if you look at the symptoms, they're very similar. Both patients have heavy periods and pelvic pain. But if you drill down a little further, in general, not always, but in general, if you ask them which of those two symptoms is worse, the fibroid ladies in general will say the bleeding is worse than the pain. The adenomyosis ladies will typically say the pain is worse than the bleeding. Yeah, I would agree with that. The pain was worse. The pain, the the heaviness was really bad, but the pain was. Yeah. I don't wish that pain on anyone. It was really, really horrific. Like, and nothing would really help it. I would get like one pain-free period a year, and that would give me like a lot of uh, hope and. So my last pain-free period was actually, I was in Paris, it was in February, and I got so excited. I'm like, okay, it's cured and I'm okay. And I'm like, this is great, I feel amazing. And that would have literally happen just once a year. And for the most part, I'm throwing up every single month. 
and the pain would sometimes go for like 58 to 72 hours straight, straight through the night, like just straight, where then you're so exhausted from the pain, it feels like you've been in labor for three days, and then you're just like, you actually have PTSD from the pain, that's how bad it is. Like, I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, like my body would be in shock from it. Like, you know, it was, it was really awful and stress really intensifies it. Um, and so does the constipation, by the way. And I just want to say, if you guys are experiencing adenomyosis or constipation, I realized that grains really constipate, rice really constipate. And everybody's different. Everybody's body reacts differently to what they're, constipated with but i'll tell you one little natural secret that we like using um is dried apricot and they're high in they're high in iron as well yeah and it, it helps with it if you can stay constipated through through that um uh, that that would be surprising yeah <laughs> well this was great thank you so much oh my pleasure anytime um okay. if People Where can, can we find you? Yeah, they. Uh, my website is atlii.com, atlii.com. Um, we're on Instagram. Um, that's at dr, like doctor, dr underscore my last name. So it's dr underscore L-I-P-M-A-N. We, ha we have a YouTube channel with over 150 videos on fibroids, adenomyosis, and the fibroid embolization procedure, that's at Atlanta Fibroid Center. Okay, great. And, can... and I'm gonna ta I'll tag that in the post as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Oh, Lip. Sure. Tell me. One last thing. If they want to see a documentary that we put out, um, they can go to fibroidfilm.com. It's about a it's a little bit under an hour, and it and it it goes through a number of these women that were told they had to have surgery for fibroids, either myomectomy or hysterectomy. And fortunately, at the last minute, they found us and they got their life back. So it's fibroidfilm.com. It's a, it was a documentary that actually got nominated for a medical Emmy. It was, uh, the, the quality of the film may be a little rough because it's not done in high, you know, really high def uh, kind of stuff. But if they can get by that and just watch the message, um, uh, we're, we're pretty proud of what we put out there. Thank you so much, Dr. Lippman. I will be in touch with you too. We'll do a follow-up with the MRI in two more months. Great. I'm glad you're doing well and, and I appreciate it. Anytime you want me to come on, I'm happy to talk about this. Okay, great. Okay, thanks so much. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.